Friends, thank you very much for joining us. Great to have you with us. James, very good to see you. Yeah, very good to see you too, Ian. Yeah, yeah. And are you keeping well? I'm okay, actually. Had a week off, so, you know. Oh, excellent. Good. That's yeah. right. So you're raring to go. Raring to go. And where are we in the lectionary? We are on Easter 4. Yes. And we are on John chapter 10, verses yes. 11 to 18. We are. Now, before we go any further, we ought to remind our loyal viewers what we love them to do, should we not? We should. We'd love you to like the videos, uh, subscribe to the channel. Yep, little button down there. Um, share on the social media. Share on the social media, yes, indeed. So you can click the button and you copy the link and then post it wherever you may. Make a comment on it. And then also comment on the YouTube video or wherever you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'd great. love to get some good comments and hmm. hear what you've got to say. It is. And just a little reminder as well, we say this from time to time that, you know, as you're listening along, it's really quite good to have the text in front of you. So you might have a print Bible text in front of you or, yeah. or you know, electronic text in whatever form you, you follow. So and one of the things I love to do is to have different languages open in front of me. So I've got the Greek and then English and then I'm learning Spanish at the moment. And I learned Italian last year and I learned French when I was at school. So it is quite kind of interesting. Just again, it's an exercise in slowing our reading down. So we see what the text mm. says. And, and also sometimes it is quite interesting to see how other translations, other languages yeah, it is. make decisions yeah. about, you know, translation of the Greek. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Um, right. So we are in John chapter 10. Now, this is, <laughs> I don't know if we say this every time we make a switch from one gospel to the other. I I just feel, having been in Mark quite a lot. Yes. And then last week we switched into Luke, didn't we? Because we did. Yeah. The, the bit in Luke 24, the second half of Luke 24 after the road to Emmaus bit, the bit which which actually I think we both felt wasn't nearly as engaging as the road to Emmaus. But then having talked about it, we changed our mind. I think we did. I think it was just 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 yeah. having that conversation re yeah. really helped yeah. me I know, to to see so yeah. see the riches in it. So, yeah, yeah well, a good a good example, actually, that talking about scripture, um, holding it in conversation with yes. one another is. Yes. Christians is a really important thing, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. And it, 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 it's just very animating. And you see, you get insights that other people, yeah, from other people that you haven't seen, but also even actually having a conversation about it. I mean, the, the four modes of learning are reading, writing, speaking and listening as well. And it is also the mm. case that sometimes when we articulate something, yes, we suddenly realize that's what we think. We have yes, absolutely. And I'm generally somebody who speaks to think. So it, that's quite familiar. Yeah. Really, so I'm often sparked by what other people say, and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. also sometimes by what I myself say. And so. what's fascinating is that's kind of a function of cognition, neuroscience, whatever. It's not particularly personality related because actually it doesn't make no. a difference between whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. I mean, I think I'm more of an extrovert, you're more of an introvert, mm. and yet we both find it very stimulating. Yeah, yeah, both find it really helpful. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. conversation, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, having said that, the reason I mentioned that is because having gone Mark to Luke, once again, now we're going back to john and the fourth gospel and uh, again just preparing for this conversation i've been struck by the the how different the feel is of these texts yes uh, where you know with 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 when we looked at mark 16 a couple of weeks ago it was very dense and and you really had to unpack it and it was it moved very quickly uh in luke we had loads of ideas put together in quite a sophisticated way and now we come to this text in john 10 it it just feels very different it's kind of like this thing of of chewing over and circling around and repeating things and digging every time you go around, you dig something else out. So it really does have a distinctive ethos. Although I, I suppose I ought to say that it's a distinctive ethos when you cluster the gospel together. Of course, when you compare them with other literature, uh, yeah. very close to one another. But once you zoom in, you, you, you feel the differences, don't you? Yeah, you do. And I mean, John always feels very, very different, doesn't it, from the, from the synoptics. Hmm. Um, and I suppose I'm also wondering that, I mean, one of the things that I think the lectionary does is it cycles through passages in John 10 um, over the different lectionary years. Yeah, it does. So we only get half of the this sort of passage of the Good Shepherd in yeah. the sense in John 10. And I suppose we get it because of the reference to the resurrection at the, at the end. You know, I, I, I lay down my life to take yeah. it up again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that's the reason it's here, yeah. because otherwise it's a little bit difficult to kind of completely grasp why mm. why 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 this particular passage i mean last week's was very obvious this week perhaps not so not so instantly no, obvious no. Mm. but it also the fact that on on this week of the lectionary year in the successive years you yes. cycle through the three sections of 
the chapter yes yes uh is 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 quite demanding on your memory so <laughs> it is yeah. and it means you don't really have continuity and and, and, I, and i guess this is the argument the traditional argument for saying why we should have sermon series and, and particularly lectionary is permissive and, and you can do that in ordinary time but it's yeah. really valuable actually doing something sequential and, yeah. and and at one level the lectionary is in, in theory giving us some continuous reading through the gospels but actually it's often broken up in rather frustrating ways yeah yeah um, just worth noting, while we're focusing on sort of the context where we are, so we're in John, John 10, 11 to 18. Um, and it's just worth noting that that this chapter division, chapter divisions don't obviously belong to the biblical text itself. They're um, introduced by Stephen Langton, uh, yeah. Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century. Um, but but actually, John 10 is, as a chapter is a bit frustrating because it actually straddles quite a big sort of division, doesn't it? Um because we've had the action again it's just worth locating this which is yes. easy to forget isn't it that we've actually been in jerusalem um since chapter 7 verse 10 because chapter 6 of the feeding of the 5000 happened in bethsaida in the north yes then in john 7 10 jesus heads off secretly to the yes. piece of the tabernacles and we've been in jerusalem all this time haven't we chapter seven eight, we, we we have and then and, and then in the, the bit that follows this we we it, it's the feast of um of dedication uh, hanukkah so you you end up with this oh, we're kind of between these two these two feasts but yeah. all of, they say all of this action has taken place there and the continuity particularly it feels with the story of the healing of the blind man in chapter nine mm. i mean the audience is is the same at the beginning of chapter 10 as it has been at the end of chapter nine. So this is part of um, yeah, this continuing narrative of dispute. It's a continuing that. narrative. So the chapter division really doesn't help us here. It, it just. Um, no, in, fact, in fact, in fact, chapter 10 verse one is like sort of halfway through Jesus' speech. Isn't it, it? Literally. Yeah, literally. It's very strange. Very strange. Very, it is but, very odd. But all, also worth noting, and we'll come, well, two things I think one we'll come back to. First of all, the disciples here are absent. Yes. So, of course, the question is, who's the eyewitness here who's telling us all this stuff? And I think for me, confession here, for me, this is why I keep talking about this as the fourth gospel, not the gospel of John, because I think I'm persuaded by Richard Borkin's argument that the beloved disciple who's the eyewitness is a Jerusalem-based disciple, not one of the 12, because the yes. 12 are just not in view here at all. Yeah, That contributes to this impression you have in the fourth gospel as Jesus as the lonely hero figure. Yes. So it's basically him against the rest. Yep. Yes. Um, but but also the other thing that's interesting is that this is, again, part of the dispute with the Pharisees who've mm -hmm. been critical of the healing of the blind man. But, but interestingly, when we get towards the end of this passage, we'll find that that opposition is actually quite nuanced. It is, yes. It's it's not... Um, we can't have a generalisation about the Pharisees' opposition, can we? That would be... Uh, that, that doesn't seem okay. to stack up. Yeah, because they are divided about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Also, a little insight into the language of the Jews, because again, they mentioned quite a lot in this yes. section. Yes, and and given that Jesus is in Jerusalem, then this is a reason for in these these cases, uh, the it makes sense to read the the term Judaioi as Judeans or the yes. leader or the Jerusalem leaders. Yes, yes, people people of, of that particular geographical location yeah. right in 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 Judea. Judea yeah, yeah. We, we can't we can't interpret this as. Jesus versus the Jews, because no, we can't. No, no, I always have to be careful. Jesus about is that. a Jew. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, especially in the fourth gospel. So, uh, indeed. Yeah. 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 Right. So, where do we get to? We're now looking at verse eleven. Um, yeah. Uh, fascinating. Interesting. Different English translations vary on whether there's a, a break here. Verse eleven. I think both in the Greek text mm. I'm looking at and in the NIV, verse eleven is actually the start of a new section. But it is quite curious, isn't it? Because the bit before, which we talked about last year, it's described as a paroimia. Yeah. And it's often said that it's often said that the fourth gospel doesn't have any parables. And of course, we get the parabolic teaching, the classic one in Mark 4 with the parable of the sower. We get many more of them in Matthew, and we also get them in Luke. But of course, actually, paroimia and parable are kind of interchangeable. So I'm not I'm not yeah. convinced that the stuff about the shepherd in the first half of the chapter is very different from the parables we get in the synoptics yeah i think i mean it, it it certainly it's it's different in the sense that it's more the the parable is is much more in small sections of of little bits of narrative yeah. 
Jesus kind of paints little pictures rather than on a on a bigger canvas, which it feels like in the in the other gospels. Yeah. Um, but they're certainly it's certainly parabolic. I mean, yeah, I mean that is absolutely he's drawing a, a typical picture from the life of of the people of the time that they would have understood readily, which of course yeah. is exactly what he does in all the other contexts as well. I guess a slight different feel is that here there's more of a sense of he's describing a situation, whereas in most of the synoptic yes. parables there's a sort of like there's there's a narrative shape so uh, yes, somebody, does something, say, yes. somebody does yeah. something else and the result yeah. is this whereas here he's kind of saying this is how being a being a good shepherd what it's yeah. like yeah yeah but what's really startling which i didn't think i'd quite tweaked in the same way is that in the first part which we talked about last year jesus is just talking about shepherds in general Yes. And only when we get to verse eleven that he says, "Oh, oh, by the way, that's me. I, yes. I, I'm, yes. I'm the good shepherd. It's me who's the good shepherd. I'm the one here. I'm talking about. Yes. So, yes. Which is which is quite amusing. But again, we actually saw that when we looked at um at John twelve, where he said he says that a seed fall if a seed unless a grain falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it falls into the ground and dies, then it bears much fruit. And yeah. it doesn't. He said, "Well, okay, that's a nice thing about sowing seeds. I've just been sowing lettuce seeds and." And, and beetroot and all sorts of stuff so so well you'd say well that that is true jesus but so what and of course actually the whole point is the bit he doesn't say which is that yeah. he yeah. is the one who is the grain who is going to yeah. fall into the ground but he ever never actually says it no no and the, and the previous action is he's, he's i'm the gate for the sheep but he hasn't said anything about being the shepherd no. so it's absolutely yeah it becomes explicit here which is really interesting isn't it because this whole image of a shepherd is resonant from the old testament isn't it for the people of those times I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely all, all the way through the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's always associated with, with God, the, the God of Israel. It's, it's what the Lord the Lord is to his people. He is, he is the shepherd. Yeah. So this um, Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, I mean, I don't think it could be heard in any other way no. than a, a, what we would call a very high Christology. It's a claim of divinity, isn't it? It's a, yeah. you know, that's, that they would have heard that. And, and no doubt the division that results from this discourse um, is partly due to that, I suspect. Yeah, yeah. And that shepherd imagery, obviously there is one bit in Ezekiel where Ezekiel criticises the leader of Israel for being poor shepherds. But, yeah. But but, yeah. but but immediately goes on to talk about, about God as the shepherd of Israel. Yeah. And I think it's actually, as you say, there's explicit mentions that, well, of course, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. Um, but it, it actually goes beyond the, the words themselves because, of course, what a shepherd does is leads his people and God has led his people through the wilderness. A shepherd provides food and provides water. And of course, exactly that's the imagery that God is providing the food for Israel and providing the water and providing what they need. And of course, provides for that in the promised land, which is flowing with yeah. honey. So so it, it, it's not just this explicit implication. It's actually the implicit sense of all the ways that God provides for his people as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But immediately in this, I'm the good shepherd. But immediately Jesus goes on to introduce an idea which yeah. isn't in the Old Testament at all, which is the idea that the good shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. Yeah. Which is yeah. which is going to be equally startling, I think, to the Jesus. Uh, uh, completely. I mean, it's a classic case of Jesus taking an Old Testament idea and reinterpreting it. Uh in and 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 often, as we saw with the temple image earlier on in John 2, um, in, in relation to himself. Yeah. And and that and and this is uh, this is a complete shocker i mean they they know that the shepherd is the life of the shepherd is is in a sense um costly but certainly not that costly yeah. uh and it's certainly not anticipated to be that that costly so it's very interesting isn't it and and this part here which i i, I there's an interesting structure i think in this passage isn't there because mm. this saying i am the good shepherd is then paralleled um in verse 14 again isn't it well, yeah. along with yeah. the laying down of the life of the sheep but with an interesting um interpolation in, in in there as well yeah. um so interesting yeah this is a good moment i've just got a, a little screen grab to share yeah uh, that'd be helpful if i can um identify it well sorry folks hold on a second yeah here it is uh so this is just a quick table really about the this is the structure of the first 18 verses um yeah. so first of all you get the contrast between the shepherd and the thief but then in that section nobody no one's ident Jesus isn't identifying who's who and then you've got the contrast between the door and the thief. Uh, interesting, again, you know, there's this theory that um, uh, Jeremias um, popularized that parables have one main point. But of course, oh, that's, yes. that's yeah. not the case here at all. And oh. it's interesting how Jesus shifts the imagery, doesn't he, with, for things which actually yeah. clash quite, quite a you bit. You have to keep work quite hard to keep up with him. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. 
And then we come into our passage and you start off with, again, the contrast between the shepherd and the hired hand. So once Jesus identifies himself as a good shepherd, then that contrast becomes quite explicit. And as you say, this leads to division because the implication for the Jewish leaders who are listening to Jesus is that they are mere hired hands. Yeah. And he's yeah. contrasting himself with them. But then in the second half of our passage, we get this whole sequence of things that really are just about the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows his sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. He brings all the sheep into one flock. The sheep listen to his voice, which we've heard again from the first part. Yeah. And again, this reiteration of I lay down my life and I take it up again. So um, reiterating the laying down beforehand. But as you say, you're then adding in this dimension of taking it up again. Yeah. And it's, I think it's particularly interesting, the the parallel at the, the begins of verse 14, which you've got there, it's, it, where it says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me. And I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I mean, that, that when you think about that, I mean, that is the most astonishing thing for Jesus to say, isn't it? That the intimacy that he has with the father um, is the kind of intimacy that he's going to have with his followers. Yes. And it comes about through the sacrificial love which he shows um, for the sheep. I mean, I, that is, I, don't, I think that's just completely mind blowing, really. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it, once again, it's another dimension of reinterpreting the Old Testament images of shepherd. Right. That, that 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 are. I mean, he goes way beyond that. I think in yeah. in what's really being said. So, yeah. um, and and I suppose in a sense also he's he's pointing us back to um that vision of intimacy of human beings with the with their creator, which is there in Genesis. Yeah, you know they they, the they walk yeah. the original intention. So so that's once again another astonishing claim, mm. Mm. an astonishing promise, really. Yeah. Mm. And we, we ought to observe as well, very typical of the fourth gospel, where an idea, a seed is sown, sort of as it were, a Nietzsche here, uh, and then it's yes. picked up later and, and, and amplified. So we get this theme emerging in the farewell discourse of precisely that point about, you know, I and the Father and one, and you and I are one, and we, you know, we, we are yes. one, and so on. I've and, called you friends, and, yeah. yeah. And, exactly. And, and then, yeah. of course, the image of the vine as well, so believers are integrated into yeah. you know, yeah. who, Je who Jesus is, so... Yeah, well, it's just useful to see that overview uh, of of the structure. Um, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, go on. I think another. I, mean, I think another thing which is just worth pointing out is that um, the fourth gospel doesn't do predictions of the passion in the way that the synoptics do. Um, but this is actually, I mean, in this passage, really functions like that, doesn't it? Because Jesus is very clearly saying, "I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep." So he he does hear in parabolic form what what is made ex, which is ex, what is explicit in the synoptics. Mm -hmm. So we should just kind of notice that that um, it's very similar but different, as it were. And there's a really really interesting dynamic here, which is that although in many ways Jesus appears to be a passive victim, I mean I noticed this during Easter, looking at particularly at say John 19. So Jesus is 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 handed over, and it's Jesus who is crucified. So it, it's it's all it's all passive stuff. But actually, all through the narrative, there's a very strong sense of Jesus being in control. So, for example, in in John 19, Jesus it says very pointedly, Jesus carried his own cross. Whereas, of course, in the in the synoptics, we get Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross. Yeah. So so although the soldiers hand him over, he's actually in charge. And of course, that's been the same with his trial before. Pilot, he's the pilot says, I've got power over you. And Jesus says, You've no power over me. Yeah, no power because, all because that power has been given to you. And here, this is the anticipation of it. I lay down my life. It's not taken from me. I lay it no. down. Yes. And I take it up. Yeah. So here, Jesus is very much as the as the shepherd, is the active agent who determines what will happen to him, which is very yeah. striking. It is very striking indeed. Yeah. It's extraordinarily powerful. Mm. Now, the other thing we ought to notice here is that there has been a bit of a shift between the scenario of the shepherd in the opening bit and the scenario of the shepherd later on. And I think um, mm. uh, Kenneth Bailey is, is good on that, because I know you've been reading Bailey mm. in, in the um, his book on the, the Good Shepherd. Yeah, that, um, just a quick plug. Throw that up there. I mean, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good book on this this passage. I mean, it covers other other passages as well. But, um, mm. it, yeah, it, it's, it's particularly, um, particularly useful, yeah. Now, yeah. for people who aren't familiar with Bailey, Tell, tell us a bit about what what's the kind of insights he brings. What's he trying to yeah, do? Yeah, well, he, he Ken Vay is a scholar who lived in the Middle East for most of his life, um, American scholar. But he and, and he he basically researched um, many many communities um, in in the in, in the, there which haven't really changed a lot. Many of them have not changed particularly, and and so he 
um, and he's done a lot of linguistic work on um, these Semitic languages and, and so on. So mm. he he does a huge amount of cultural analysis, but he also does a lot of linguistic oral tradition down to written tradition analysis. Yeah. And uh, that they're deeply insightful. And I would say he's always worth reading on, yeah. on anything in, in the New Testament. Yeah. 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 And he's right. written on the Gospels. He's also written on Paul as well, hasn't he? He, he has, yeah. And he especially wrote a lot of, a lot on the Luke Gospel, on the parables in Luke, um, yeah. which are particularly yeah, good. Course. Yeah. And of course, he points out, amongst many other people, that Jesus was not born in a stable. Indeed, he is one of those who very <laughs> trenchantly um, <laughs> points that out. Yeah. Just be, because of the cultural reality of where you, yes, yeah, and I mean, he's family he, where you keep yeah. your animals. Precisely. He he he's, he even has pictures to show you where he was born. So it's he very does, helpful. And, and, and very useful they are too. Yeah. Um now does he bring a particular insight into what we're getting into now? So chapter verse eleven, I'm the good shepherd, the good shepherd laying down his life. And then again we get into in verse twelve the contrast between the shepherd and the hired hand that we've had before, who does not own the sheep, and sees yes. the, sees the wolf coming. Yes, he's, I mean, he sees this as a, he sees the scene of this scenario as the wilderness. I mean, it, it, I think the previous part of the passage, uh, one, one to 10, has been in the sort of village scenario of, of a shepherd and, and the sheep of, of the community. Here he sees them out in the wilderness in a, in a, in a sort of dangerous situation. And um, I mean, the, uh, presumably what he, what, what, what this, uh, what Jesus is saying here would have been entirely familiar to him, to them, that they, the hired, the hired shepherd doesn't have a, an interest no. uh, particularly in in the well-being of the sheep whereas yeah. as, as jesus as the, the sort of owner of the sheep does mm -hmm. and and that contrast is is very powerfully expressed and what's interesting also is that of course the implication here is that the shepherd dies at the because of the wolf's actions um oh, okay so but 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 that's not made explicit in terms of jesus dying at the hands yeah. of so yeah. That that part is is it's not glossed over. It's just it's quite clear that that is the case. Yeah. But it's interesting. The New Testament seems to be more interested, and this is what something that Bailey points out is more interested in the what the cross means um, that that it did happen and what it means, rather than in the precise mechanism, gory details. Yeah. Oh yeah. right. Oh yeah. No, the gory, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so and, that's and, interesting. And, and the gory details were not necessary because, again, in in context, yeah, but people, 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 everyone knows what not, crucifixion. Not is. familiar. Yeah. Yeah. But then we get a reiteration in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And of course, this yeah. belongs within the fourth gospel of the classic seven I am's. I'm the bread of life. I'm the life of the world. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection yeah. of life. I'm the way, the truth and the life. I'm the vine and the vineyard. Um, and again, it's worth seeing how these belong together, how they connect with the discourse. But of course, all of them, as you've said already on this, rooted in Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and making some really, really serious Christological claims. Yes. Yeah. Um, then we get into um, knowing the Father. Now, you've already talked about this, about the intimacy. Uh, yeah. So as I know uh, uh, the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And again, fascinating to see those two things juxtaposed. Yes. And then, and that sets us up for the, for almost for the second part of our passage, doesn't it? Yeah. We've got this, um, we, we've got the cross in, in verse 15 i lay down my life for the sheep we then have um what i suppose is a is a missional task isn't it um i've got other sheep uh not of this fold and so on yeah and then we end up going to the cross and resurrection i lay down my life in order to take it up again i was saying at the beginning this this seems to be why we're reading it in 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 easter in this time yeah and you, you've got this is a really interesting structurally i mean one of the things that bailey points out that this cross mission cross and resurrection sequence yeah. is exactly the sequence you have in 1 Corinthians where we begin in chapter 1 with the foolishness of the cross yeah. we end up in chapter 8 with the the emission to Jew and Gentile and then in in 1 Corinthians 15 we're back to the cross and this extended discourse on the resurrection yeah. as the yeah. the launching pad for the mission uh, of uh, of the disciples yeah. so that's a that's a really interesting. I thought that was a really fascinating because yeah. Bailey often makes connections between Paul's teaching and the teaching of Jesus, yes. which is a really important yes. thing to do because people yes. often try to sort of deny separate that, them. yeah, yeah and they true. don't need to be separated. And um, again, we've we've made some of those connections before, where we've said, oh, "Well, that reminds me of something in Paul," even if he expressed it in a slightly different register. 
Yeah. Um, but this language in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I oh. think it's, yeah. Well, it's really fascinating. It's fascinating and intriguing. Um, and I mean, I'm sure you've come across this as well, where people have said to me, oh, well, that just goes to show you don't need to be a Christian to be saved because oh. Jesus has sheep who are Muslims or Buddhists or or materialists or atheists or whatever. Um, but actually, that that doesn't quite work in terms of the passage, in terms of, of what Jesus says is going to happen to them and for them, does it? No, it doesn't, because, it, because of course, they, it, they're, they're going to be one flock under yeah. one shepherd so they're all be acknowledging yeah the lordship of jesus what is interesting and i think once again i think bailey points this out is that he doesn't say one sheepfold so there's still room oh, okay for yeah. cultural distinctives and cultural distinctiveness there's a diversity of, of culture here yes um but it's still one flock and one shepherd and that's something that the church has i, I think at its best always values isn't it i mean we gain an enormous amount from seeing how Christianity is worked out in different cultures, uh, and 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 learning from them, uh, our brothers and sisters yeah, in Christ around yeah, the world. Yeah, uh, and we we recognise when we when we meet that we're one flock and one shepherd, but we are not necessarily in the same sheepfold. No, so it's quite, no, I no. thought it's quite an interesting little nuance that that Bailey yeah. picks up here. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it, that it just sort of slips in at the end of verse sixteen, but it's really emphatic. There is one flock and one shepherd. Very well, emphatic. Again, making some other some other connection so it, it immediately for me goes to ephesians 4 where jesus where, where paul says there's one faith one dust there's one lord one spirit yeah so again that re repeated emphasis on unity and of course the other text can't go through a session without mentioning it is the book of revelation of course not no no <laughs> where you get seven times you get this fourfold phrase with variations that's never repeated the same way twice well, which is which is very good. It's not repeated the same way twice because it, it, in 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 that re sevenfold repetition of the fourfold phrase in different ways, it actually embeds the whole concept of variety. And that expression is uh, one uh, from uh, people from every tribe, language, nation, and tongue, kingdom. Yes. Anyway, yes. Or, or, or variation of those things. That yeah. this four, yeah. fourfold fourfold phrase coming seven times. So it's an emphasis very much on saying, yeah, this is this is what we found in Jesus that the grace of God. Yeah. To, to Jewish Israel has now in Jesus spilled out over the boundaries of over yeah. ethnic boundaries and now is is incorporating all, all nations in this, which, of course, was actually the vision from the very beginning. Yeah. But it, it's the promise to Abraham that, you know, your offspring will be more than the sound of the seashore or the stars in the sky. It's the vision beginning of Isaiah that all the nations will be drawn to. Yes, to, to, to Zion. Yeah. To Zion. yeah. And the whole point that, you know, Zion, the, the point, the purpose of Israel was to be a light to the nations, to to, yeah. to, to show God the truth of God to, to, to all the world. It is striking, though, isn't it, that you get this little glimpse of, I mean, I think the language we'd use is you get this little, little, little preview of the Gentile mission in the fourth gospel. Yes. Which, yeah. which is intriguing because, because with its, focus through the festivals this is the sort of i mean we might say matthew's the jewish gospel in many ways but actually actually the, john is much is is, is, yeah. is so jewish because you know you have the, the the first sign is the wedding at cana with the uh the, the water in the set six pots which are for jewish purification you get the whole thing building around the series of, of festivals and the and the whole jerusalem focus here as well you do and of course we the other day the other week we looked at john 12 didn't we when the greeks come to um to to to, to philip and andrew and and onto yeah. Jesus. So, as the trigger, as it were, for the the um, uh, for the passion for for yeah. Jesus, Jesus saying the hour has come. Yeah. So indeed, mm. indeed. But 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 again, the slightly obscure way this is done, it's not kind yeah. of obvious no. in the way it is in Matthew or no. Mark or Luke, Something. and it's a little sort of hint and anticipation, saying you know if you've got eyes to see us, then you'll you'll see this little hint here. You understand what it is that yeah. that, that it, it's those it's the Greeks, the Gentiles who come to to Jesus, which provokes then as you say, this, this climactic moment. Yeah. Uh, then we get into verse 17. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life. I may take it up again. It's quite an unusual phrase, isn't it? It is. That's a really difficult translation, isn't it? Um, I, I think Bailey has an, has an alternative to that. I can't um, just instantly remember what he, how he puts it, but um, he, it, it, it's, you know, it's not, what he's saying is that this is not saying that, um jesus earns the father's love by his exactly name. exactly and what, what i think the point he makes is that um jesus as the father's son is the inheritor of all, all that is characteristic of you know he's he, he, he is of, of the father so there's no there's no distinction in terms of how this should be done 
Mm. Um, the, the love of the father and, uh, and the son is is not in question. Yeah. It's not yeah. enhanced by this or anything. Yeah. Um, so I think he I think his translation might be on account of uh, okay. instead of yeah, for yeah, this yeah. reason, which which is a you know, but it's a tricky thing yeah. to it's a tricky thing to it, translate. It, but yeah, it is. And then we end to verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Again, it's yeah. supremely in this gospel, that centrality on the agency of Jesus, that, 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 which again, I think is rather important in holding together um, Jesus's um, deliberate offering of himself. Uh, I think sometimes when I see discourse about Jesus being a victim, I, it worries me in the sense that Jesus is the helpless victim who, who wasn't crucified because of his own design but because somebody else took charge of him uh, mm. and again i guess particularly in some sort of liberation theologies we see jesus as the helpless victim and therefore yeah. we're encouraged because when we feel helpless jesus was helpless too mm. but but both in the synopsis in different ways and here of course it's very really clear that jesus is offering his life for us so it yeah. is an it is an act of sacrifice and an act of love for us and and mm. and the fourth gospel here makes that very explicit yeah yeah this charge yeah. Now, we're kind of at the end of our lectionary passage. I just think it's worth noting again, it's straying into verse 19, which is going to be what we're actually going to look at next, next year. Yes. Um, or we looked at two, two years ago. Yeah. Um, there was, a, again, a division among the Jews because of these words. Some mm -hmm. said these are demons in saying why them. Others said these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And again, a couple of reasons worth noting that. One is that... Um, the the jews the jewish leaders the judeans the pharisees aren't actually portrayed as a homogeneous group who are no. universally opposed to jesus because and probably as we've seen nicodemus who is a yeah counsel yeah. uh who comes to him by night and obviously becomes a disciple so it is worth attending to those nuances and the way these groups are portrayed in the fourth gospel definitely yeah definitely and some come to follow him and I think it's also worth, and this is where I think probably where we'll, we'll finish, just a little observation that I make in the written article, where, again, we're very inclined to see the image of the Good Shepherd as kind of a comforting pastoral oh, thing yes, for us. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Which, which it is. <laughs> but in all these contexts, it's actually got a real edge to it as well. So just my, my sort of closing observation. These sayings do not offer a cosy image of comfort to those already part of the community of faith, nor to the general reader. They're generated in the heat of conflict and division created both by Jesus's teaching and by his actions, as we saw from chapter nine, they sit within the paradox of grace and judgment within this gospel as a whole. So although Jesus has come to save the world and not to judge it yet, judgment comes when people make a decision about how to respond to Jesus. We, we saw that in John three, John three, 16, 17, 18, Jesus's claim to be the true shepherd of God's people means that we need to make a response as to whether we will follow him. But to those who do receive him, these words offer hope and life. Safety is no longer to be found in a place, in a sheepfold in the land of Israel, or the social space of conformity to the law, but in a person, in the knowledge of Jesus and obedience to the call of his voice as he calls us by name. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's encouragement. Yeah. That was a bit of a challenge here too. Yeah. Yeah. James, thank you very much for your time. Great to chat with you. Friends, thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget those four things. Click on like, subscribe, so you can get future videos as well. Uh, click on the share button. You can copy and paste it on the social media. And if anything we've said which you think is interesting or curious or challenging or puzzling or you want to push back, then do put a comment here or elsewhere online. We'd love mm -hmm. to engage with it. Yeah. James, thank you. See you next time. Thank you.